This is like a joke. It's a comedy of errors. The baby just discontinued my Facebook Live segment, so I'm back, and hopefully you follow me. Back to Naptime Nutrition, take three. So, mentioned private toddler test kitchen. I mentioned <laughs> I do private counseling, small group counseling, all of your nutrition obstacles between pregnancy and toddlerhood, and today we're talking about intuitive eating, and I have a baby on my lap who hopefully <laughs> will not kick me off Facebook Live again. You're supposed to be taking a nap. Yeah. Anyway, waiting for Ellie Sheva Dorfman, um, licensed marriage and family therapist, who is going to be joining me. She specializes in feeding issues and, and eating disorders as well. And we're talking about intuitive eating, and it's something that I've really gotten into lately because um, I got involved with a, a group of women who really specialize in it, and it's a group of women who are dietitians and therapists and health coaches. Ah, there you are. Okay, let's see if I can, oh my God, I can't even invite you. <laughs> this whole thing is a joke. Um, trying to invite my special guest and it's not letting me. Ooh. Wow, that's frustrating. It's not giving me the option. Video only. Come oh. on, oh, it's not letting me invite you. After all that, okay, well, <laughs> it's just a joke today. Uh, okay, so hang around and, and give some comments. That's really disappointing. We do have an option where you can take over my Facebook and do um, do a live video, and maybe we'll, we'll do that after if you're into that. Um, okay, well, I planned a really awesome one. I'll come again next week. Don't worry. Okay, well, we'll figure it out. Sorry about that. So, I guess I'm on my own today. Um, I have lots of notes, though. Okay, so what is intuitive eating? I talk, about, I talk a lot about start eating when you're hungry, stop eating when you're full. And the thing is that it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but that's pretty much the gist of intuitive eating. It's listening to your body and following your body signals. So, the, the whole idea of following intuitive eating as opposed to some of these crazy diets out there is that you can avoid food preoccupation. Concentrating so much on food is really, it, it takes up so much real estate in your brain. So we can avoid that. I mean, think about, think about how many times you, you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see. Or you, you look on your plate and you think, I could do better than this. Or you're just constantly preoccupied with doing better and being better. And how much better could you use that energy to be a good mother, spend time with the kids, and just really be, be more present in your life? How much energy is being sucked up by that food preoccupation? So let's just get rid of it. it get rid of the diet mentality. And look into intuitive eating. And I've, if you're interested, I've got some links. I've got some references for you. Um, so let me know in the comments. So um, nourishment is more than food. Nourishment is the mind-body connection. Not only are you nourishing your body, but you're nourishing your brain. And this little kid really wants to be part of the broadcast. So here we go. There you go. Okay. Now there's a happy baby who hopefully will not kick me off again. Paula, thanks for joining us again. <laughs> so many, so many issues today. Anyway, um, you may think that your child's relationship with food starts with food introduction or even later on. But the truth is that your child's relationship with food starts at the breast or the bottle. I'm going to move somewhere so that I am stationary and my phone can be stationary and you don't get... Oh, okay, back to my usual spot. All right. So it starts from the breast or the bottle. And I have talked before about, about respecting your child's hunger and satiety cues. And when you're, when you're breastfeeding, when they're done, they're going to look away. They're going to spit the, the nipple out. They're going to turn their head, clamp, start laughing at you. Um, they're going to tell you that they're full. And the same with the bottle. The thing is that with a bottle, the liquid comes out a little bit faster. And because of that, it's easy to, to kind of force it. And it's easy to look at the tick marks on the bottle and say, you didn't have enough today. Thank you for spitting up. He's giving some of his back. 
It's easy to say to a bottle-fed baby, you didn't have enough according to the textbook. You're supposed to have fill-in-the-blank ounces of fluid, and you didn't, so I'm, I'm going to really make an effort to make you eat more. And the truth is that that is telling your child, listen to me, not to your body. And that's not the message that we want to give them. You want your child to know that their body signals are important, and it's important to listen to them. And it's going to teach them later on in life in, to listen to those body signals as well. And if you're able to keep that up, which I will give you some tips on, if you're able to reinforce the idea that what their body is telling them is the most important, not what the plate is telling them, not what you are telling them, then they're not going to have to undo a lot of the damage in the diet culture that we are facing as adults. So, so start from the beginning. You want to teach your hunger and satiety signals by respecting their body cues. If they are full, that's it. That's all, all the calories they need. Their bodies are really in tune with how much nutrition they need. And it has so much to do with how is your sleep? How much are you growing? Are you going over a developmental milestone? Did you just have a growth spurt and you're coming down from it? There are a lot of reasons why a child's calorie intake might need to be higher or lower on a given day. And we as the adult need to respect it. Um, so as I said, if they're pulling away or clamping their lips, the feeding is over. That's all. You want to, um, if you're breastfeeding, you want to burp them, offer the breast again, and if they don't take it, that's it. They've had enough nutrition. It's time for whatever activity. Um, there are no tick marks on the breast. Um, the, the original form of feeding your child is breastfeeding, and we have survived as a species for so long without those tick marks, without knowing exactly how many ounces they're getting. And if you have concern, obviously the mommy gut instinct is very important, and if you do have concern about their growth, you do want to talk to your lactation consultant, dietitian, your doctor about that, um, but in general, they're getting enough nutrition from your breast and they know how to regulate how much they want. Um, so we need to continue into toddlerhood. So when you're getting into toddlerhood, how can you respect their signals? Well, you wanna honor food jags and food patterns. And I did different um, nap time nutrition on food jags and food and eating patterns for, for kids. It's really common for toddlers to wanna skip dinner, for instance. If, if they had enough calories, if they didn't have enough activity, whatever it is, they're not hungry for dinner, so they've had enough. It's okay. You don't have to go back to the kitchen and say, but here's a peanut butter and jelly, but here's a banana, but here's an apple, but here's, here's some grapes, here's some cookies or cake or soda. You don't have to try to convince your child to eat. Your child knows when to eat and when to stop. It's us as adults who lose that ability when we, we push past, when we look at a full plate and, and subconsciously want to eat everything on the plate. So that's what we do. Um, so go back and check out that nap time nutrition. Um, their nutrition is going to balance out over, maybe over the day, maybe over a couple of days, definitely over a few weeks. A lot of studies have been done showing that kids can regulate their nutrition over a few weeks as long as you offer a variety of foods. Now, what happens when you go back into the kitchen and get those cookies, get that cake, get whatever that isn't initially on the table, is you're telling them, if you don't want to eat, it's really, really important to me that you eat. So here's a bubble over my head right now. That's pressure. That means they're going to push back. It also tells them that at any point they can refuse food and they're going to get something sweet. It also creates a food hierarchy, which I will get into. So anyway, all around, that's a bad idea to create that, that situation where you go back into the kitchen and get something different because your child doesn't want to eat. If your child does not want to eat what you serve, they're probably not hungry for a few different reasons, and we need to respect that. Um, okay, so, so creating that food hierarchy. When you tell your child finish this and I'll give you that, it says this initial food, this probably vegetable, is not as good as what I'm going to be offering next. Oh, Jessica joined us. Hey, I'm going to be calling you soon. You know it. Um, 
So you don't want to create that food hierarchy. You don't want to send that message that if you eat your broccoli, I'm going to give you a cookie. It tells them you shouldn't like broccoli, you should like cookies. And it's going to reinforce a, a sweet tooth. It's going to reinforce a possible dislike of broccoli. And we don't want to go there. Um, you, and not only... <laughs> Not only are you creating that hierarchy, but you're, you're attaching emotions to those foods. So it's really important to, to understand that while foods are different as far as their nutritional makeup, we need to keep them emotionally neutral, meaning you don't attach any emotion to that food. Okay, so let's say um, there's, there's a, a dish that my great-grandmother used to make. Okay, my great-grandmother used to make this dish, blintz casserole, where she took cheese blintzes. If, anyone, if you don't know what they are, run to your nearest kosher market. Um, so she made blintz casserole, and it was fantastic. And I have emotions that are related to that, but those emotions are eating, you know, I remember the, the feeling of eating with family. I remember the feeling of being around her and her, her positive vibes that she would put out and how nice it was to spend time all together. But that's okay. That's not what I'm talking about as far as attaching emotion to food. That's perfectly fine. When you're attaching emotion to food in an unhealthy way, it's, I feel loved when I finish my plate. I feel like mommy's happy when I eat my broccoli. That's not okay. You don't want, you don't want those type of emotions attached to food. All food should be seen on an emotionally even level. And I wish Ellie Shabu was here to to describe that further. But maybe in the comments you can uh, you can describe more of what I'm talking about from the therapist's perspective. So you don't also you also don't want to step on the scale in front of your child. You don't want to talk about dieting in front of your child. You really just you don't want to pass on any unhealthy relationship you have with food to your child. It's very important that they have a healthy relationship with food or a healthy relationship with eating your thumbs, as it were. And you, you just don't want weight to be an issue for your child. Don't make foods forbidden. This goes along with the food hierarchy. You don't want to say, you're not allowed to have this food. Furthermore, if you have a food that you don't want your child to eat, either for allergy reason, reasons or, or religious reasons or whatever, don't eat it in front of them. Uh, anything that I eat in front of my children, they're allowed to have, with the exception of coffee. <laughs> so you don't want to make foods forbidden because what happens is when your back is turned, whether it be when they're toddlers or whether it be when they go away to college, they will binge on those foods that you made forbidden. So in order to create a healthy relationship with food, they need to stay on that emotional even keel regarding any food, which means not making foods forbidden. So that's what I have to say. Hopefully we can make this, uh, this interview thing work, and I can have Elisheva back, but, um, and Daniel. Daniel, always my constant companion. Um, so... Here's my outro. Come to Toddler Test Kitchen if you are in town. It is freaking hot out there, and Toddler Test Kitchen is inside. If you want to do Toddler Test Kitchen in your house, let me know. I do private lessons. Um, uh, you can find me on Pinterest, pinterest.com slash yaffe, Instagram, babybloomnutr, Facebook, well, you're on it right now, and next week, Naptime Nutrition, I do not currently have a, a topic this kid's telling me I should put him hey, down for a nap. Yeah. So, catch you all next week. And if you have any comments, questions, ideas for topics next week, please feel free to let me know in the comments. Thanks. Bye.